Live from our seven Tasmania studios, your nightly news with Kim Miller begins now. And good evening to you. First tonight, a man who lured his friend to a secluded location before killing him execution style has been sentenced to life behind bars. Shannon James Duffy admitted to murdering Jared Lee Turner in April last year. A crime today described as planned and cold-blooded. Sentenced to a life without the son, friend and father they loved, Jared Lee Turner meant so much to those around him. Terrifying. He was like the backbone of the family. The 22-year-old was shot in the back of the head near Richmond in April 2019. Lured there by Shannon James Duffy, who falsely believed his victim had committed a sexual assault. Mr Turner's body was still warm when police found it hours later. Duffy tried to conceal his crime and was snatched by police in the darkness of Fingal days later. He admitted his guilt but changed his story until as recently as today when he withdrew claims he'd aimed for Mr Turner's back. A carefully premeditated murder by a man betraying his friend, just as Michael Brett went on to call it, a cold-blooded and callous killing carried out in the style of an execution. Just as Michael Brett described the crime as falling within the worst category of murder, he sentenced Shannon Duffy to life in prison. He'll be eligible for parole in 2037. As the prison van left, shock and sadness remained. The sentence Shannon Duffy received today doesn't bring my son Jared back home to us or his two boys. I don't know what to feel. It doesn't really feel any better. I'm probably still going. Sean McComish, 7 Tasmania News. Meanwhile, a man has pleaded not guilty to murder following the discovery of a body at South Hobart. Police were called to a Livingston Street home yesterday where they found the body of a 40-year-old man. Sean James Scott, also aged 40, faced the magistrate's court this morning. He was remanded in custody to appear in the Supreme Court in February. And a teenager has been charged following the alleged armed robbery of a riverside fish and chip shop earlier this week. Authorities claim the offender threatened a worker with a knife before fleeing with cash. The 17-year-old was arrested late yesterday after more than two days on the run from police and he faced court today. Well, the Premier has hit the road, travelling across the state to sell his post-COVID budget. His infrastructure blitz has been welcomed, but not everybody is happy with the cards they've been dealt. With the business community concerned, support measures don't go far enough. For the Premier, there was no time for a budget hangover. From Hobart... This uh, budget's been called the most important budget since World War II. ..to Launceston and then Burnie tonight. The Premier spent the day travelling around the state, selling what's been dubbed as a cautious and conservative budget. The big ticket item... Well, a $5 billion infrastructure spend uh, that will underpin 25,000 jobs. But not everyone is sold. This is not a budget for jobs. This is a budget for higher unemployment. Over half of the infrastructure projects outlined in yesterday's budgets are already behind time. The priority? Making sure that money actually gets out the door. Last year Tasmania was 8% down on its infrastructure spend, even though there was more promise by politicians than ever before. The infrastructure minister confident he can follow through. And we've already seen massive success in the delivery of our infrastructure investments. Spruiking a commitment to improve cyber security, part of a $135 million ICT splurge, which includes improvements to infrastructure in his old portfolio, health. This is something that should, should have been dealt with a, a decade or two ago. It wasn't, um, but we've been making these investments very deliberately. And while business confidence is on the rise for now... I think it's cautious optimism. I wouldn't call it a full turnaround, but it's cautious. There is some disappointment. Measures to help businesses didn't go far enough. Payroll tax would be a great one for us to get a relief on. Uh, yeah, the margins are just so small in hospitality, it's just becoming harder and harder to, to keep our head above water. Hoping the reopening of borders and easing of restrictions will provide some short-term relief. Yeah, I think so. I think um, anything that makes people feel more normal um, during their you know, hospitality visits has got to be a positive thing. And Meg Sides joins us live now from Salamanca to talk through those hospitality restrictions with one significant change coming into effect. Good evening, Meg. Now, what step forward have we taken today? 
Well, Kim, it's been a very long and a very tough year for our hospitality sector. From today, vertical drinking is once again allowed. And as you can see behind me, people are certainly starting to make the most of that. Now, there is one very big condition to that. You can only stand up and drink outside. Inside venues, it's still not allowed. Now, from today, owners will also be under much stricter contact tracing requirements. Collecting patrons' information is now mandatory. While owners have welcomed the changes to restrictions, they say it doesn't go far enough, calling for things to get back to normal as their businesses continue to struggle. We're still restricted inside where you can't stand up inside with an alcoholic drink. You can stand up, of course, if you have a coffee or a glass of water. And, of course, the no dancing ban continues to be in place till who knows when. But Kim, despite those restrictions still being in place, it looks like it's going to be a very busy night down here at Salamanca. It does. Thanks, Meg. Let's hope everyone stays vertical tonight. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. A Hobart father is urging Tasmanians to have a skin check after his melanoma almost proved fatal. Next week is National Skin Cancer Action Week and doctors are pleading for us to be sun smart as the weather warms up. Watching cricket with a mate four years ago possibly saved Chris Hills' life. He said, what's, what's that on your arm? And I said, oh, I don't know, I think it's an irritation from some gardening work or something that I was doing. And he said, oh, it just doesn't look right. I'd get that checked out if I was you. What the Hobart father thought to be irritated skin turned out to be a type 2 melanoma. The surgeon, after I had um, it removed and 14 or 15 stitches in my arm, he said, you're a very lucky man. If you left this three or four months, you might not be here today. While baby boomers are one of the highest age brackets to be diagnosed with skin cancers, young people are also susceptible. Melanoma is the primary cancer that is a killer of people under the age of 35. Our youngest melanoma patient was 16. Um, fortunately, we don't see many melanomas in the age group under 12. With the mercury rising across the state this summer, Tasmanians are being urged to slip, slop, slap. And there are things you can look out for. If something comes up suddenly that is um, irregular, a raised border, if it's tender, if it's painful, they're all signs that we should be looking for. Or if you've noticed a new mole appear after the age of 40. Elizabeth O'Neill, 7 Tasmania News. A select group of Tasmanian boxers will jump in the ring for the first time in almost a year for the upcoming National Club Championships. The skills of one unheralded Launceston fighter has the coach comparing him to one of the country's best. He's had only a handful of amateur bouts, but it's the natural ability of 17-year-old Ali Galhari that has him touted as a future star. A lot of potential and uh, I've got big things for the future for, for Ali. The Afghanistan-born boxer has been training with Graham George since moving to Australia a few years ago and possesses an impressive instinct the veteran coach has witnessed only once before. They're very, very similar movements to, uh, to Daniel Gill and that's... Uh, well, sort of gets me a little bit excited. Ali is one of four Launceston fighters who will travel to South Australia next week for the National Club Championships. It's a dream, you know. I'm nervous, but, you know, everyone is nervous before they fight. Lucas Crack is another preparing to pull on the gloves and have a crack, his first in over a year. With coronavirus, it sort of um, put everything on hold, but it's keen to get back into it. But the ring is not just a man's world. I'm quite short, so I duck under the punches. After a stellar 2019, 18-year-old Charlie Sebastian enters the elite competition as one of the favourites. See how it um, all pans out and hopefully a win. The group ready to unleash months of pent-up energy. They'll be ready to let loose. <laughs> They'll be like tigers coming out of the cage, I think. <laughs> Garth Burley, 7 Tasmanian News. Well, tonight we take a look back at one of the state's pivotal projects, marking exactly 20 years since the old Launceston seaport development got off the ground. Local developer Errol Stewart embarked on a $30 million mission to transform the run-down port into a thriving people's place. From rusty ships and mudflats to a flourishing city centrepiece, for decades, the port of Launceston had been operating as a dry dock and shipyard. It was an eyesore, but developer Errol Stewart saw potential. 
It sort of started when Les Dick painted his boat and a bit of paint floated over to my kayak. That sort of got me thinking. He was missing one thing, the funds. So a good friend came to his aid. We got on the turps and we had probably a few more than we should, but eventually he said, look, I'll lend you the 10 million as long as you pay me back and promise to pay me back. Then all he needed was council support. If the council says yes to providing the money to kickstart the development, building applications will be lodged by the end of the month. And it did. On this night 20 years ago, Launceston City Councillors voted in favour of committing just over a million dollars to help build the public boardwalk, signalling the start of a turning point for the city and paving the way for the first major project Launceston would see in years. It'll really be like the Darling Harbour um, of Launceston. And so the transformation began, including bringing a special piece of history to Tasmania, a marina from the 2000 Sydney Olympics. It's the complete Olympic yachting marina complex in Rush Cutters Bay. It's really the Rolls Royce of marinas. I went myself with a crew, pulled it all apart, put it on ship, tugged it all back. So it sounds pretty easy, but it was, it was a really, really tough job. But I'm not sure that uh, I'd probably be that adventurous again. On August 2, 2002, the boardwalk apartments and marina were officially opened. The who's who of Launceston partied into the night, celebrating one of the city's most significant developments in years. Some of the guys that own the um, dry cleaning shops had said it was their best week they'd ever had in their history uh, because everybody came in a, a tuxedo. Janie Finlay, who was mayor at the time, recalls the major milestone. I can remember the excitement in the community about opening up the river back to the city and the community down here lining the edges and excited about what it would mean going forward. We, we set a vision uh, in for 2020, early in those years, uh, and it's really fantastic that the excitement and energy from that time has created what we experience down here today. Two years later, the Seaport Hotel, which was built on top of the dry dock, opened. It was, again, probably a difficult gig at the time, um, but we had a really good engineer. It was a fellow by the name of Jim Gandy. It was a challenging and unusual project. We had the plans of the old dry dock, which we were able to assess for its, for its strength, and we used that as the foundation for the hotel. As for the apartments... There's so much mud there, so the method of construction we used was to start on the shore with land-based equipment, driving poles out in front of us and then putting precast concrete beams and slabs out in front of the equipment and then driving out onto that uh, to do the next stage. In 2015, the wooden boardwalk was replaced with recycled plastic decking and then the final missing link, the Seaport Bridge, opened in 2018. Errol says one of his proudest moments was handing the seaport back to the people of Launceston. It has become a mecca for locals to socialise, take a stroll along the river or enjoy a meal at one of the waterfront restaurants. It's a people's place now, so I uh, couldn't be more proud. Letitia Wallace, 7 Tasmania News. Ahead of World Diabetes Day, a leading endocrinologist has reminded Tasmanians of the strong link between the condition and developing heart disease. With almost 70,000 Tasmanians expected to be diagnosed with diabetes by 2025, Roland McCallum says the key to staying healthy is ensuring people get the right diagnosis and treatment as soon as possible. If you're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, your risk of having a heart attack is the same as someone who's in our coronary care unit upstairs who's just had a heart attack. Around 280 Australians are diagnosed with diabetes every day. The North West Thunder has added three local players to its stocks for 2021. Homegrown talent Mason Bragg is back with the squad after experiencing an NBL Premiership with the Perth Wildcats. Kyle Clark joins the team after playing college basketball in the United States, while Taryn Armstrong is back playing with the side before joining brother Trey in California later next year. Well, he's broken just about every bone in his body, but a Tasmanian motocross rider keeps getting better on the European circuit. The Northwest Coast Jed Beaton has had his best result yet in the MX2 Championship, finishing fourth overall and notching up his first race win in the series. From the family farm in Beulah near Sheffield to the mean dirt streets of Europe, Jed Beaton is a rider on the rise. It's been a really good building year and I'm, I'm already looking forward to next year now. 
Beijing's had his best year yet in Europe's MX2 series, finishing fourth overall in a season including his first race win. It's a sweet taste after moving to the other side of the world four years ago. His ultimate goal is to crack the top three. That's what uh, I've, I've moved my whole life over for and trained so hard for. So um, in the end, that's the ultimate goal. But like I said, it's got to be an injury free year and everything's got to go well. Every road to success has pain, beaten perhaps more than most. Broke both my legs at the same time, uh, broke both my wrists, uh, broke also both collarbones. Um, yeah, my ankle. Although briefly rattling his confidence, the 22-year-old is learning to live with the risks. You're not young and wild anymore, I guess. I think uh, most of them injuries have been a little bit my own fault and just wanting it a little bit too much, where now I think about it a lot more. Riding for the Rockstar Energy Husqvarna Racing Factory team, the 22-year-old has one last shot at cracking the MX2 podium in 2021, before age forces him up to the MXGP class the following year. His off-season will be tough, with the pandemic leaving Beaton stranded in Europe over Christmas. But racing runs in the blood. His brother got him into the sport. His family cheers him on. Your family is always the one that's there to uh, cheer you up when you're down. And if it wasn't for them, you know, you'd have a lot of bad days. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really important to me. Got up at midnight too from Italy to the interview. So great work, Jed. And this week marks 40 years since Tasmania's most famous performance in the sport of snooker when the late great Ron Atkins reached the final of the World Amateur Snooker Championship in front of a home crowd. We've dusted off some old tapes for tonight's flashback and found out a bit more about Atkins, the family man. By the time Ron Atkins had reached that famous 1980 World Final, the Tasmanian already had an astonishing three consecutive Australian titles and 15 Tasmanian. And he'd been named, as Collingwood's Des Tudnam declared... The 1975 Sportsman of the Year Award, the winner... Mr. Ron Atkins, Australian Super Champion. His reward of a return trip to the Gold Coast hailed... A pretty good sort of a prize. And Atkins was indeed a pretty good sort of a player, making the World Amateur Snooker Championship final in front of his home crowd at the Albert Hall. Remarkably, Atkins only had two days of practice before the tournament. Still, he propelled to the decider. I'll be looking for a snooker behind the yellow here. But that's where the golden run would end. A 17-year-old Englishman named Jimmy Whirlwind White would demolish Atkins in the final, turn pro straight after the tournament and go on to become one of the most successful players in the history of the game. Yeah. And there it is. Two players shaking hands. Jimmy White being congratulated by Ron Atkins. But Atkins would be cemented as a household name. Later, his household would be the subject of a Southern Cross television special. I don't know that I had uh, a natural talent. I think it was, there was a lot of hard work in the early days. Well, we also learned of Atkins the family man, although not a handyman. He's not a handyman, bottom line. Zero. No. So it takes us a bit longer to get things done around here. Clearly his prize from 1973 wasn't much use. On behalf of our sponsor, Black & Decker, we'd like you to accept this product of theirs. Of course, his true legacy is as Tasmania's finest snooker player, as longtime friend Rex Swain, who helped set up the 1980 championship, will attest. The other thing that happened was he was awarded uh, Order of Australia, OAM, and uh, that was uh, very fitting for the man that Ron Atkins was for our sport in, uh, in Tasmania and Australia. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Happy Friday. 23 degrees today in Hobart. Launceston had a top of 20 degrees with 18 in Burnie and Devonport. 25 degrees today at Friendly Beaches, 23 for Bushy Park. Cressy, Fingal, St Helens and Grove all hit 21. 19 on Flinders Island with 18 degrees at Smithton, Wynyard and Scottsdale. 17 for Lowhead and Sheffield. On the charts, low cloud is visible across the state today. Further out, a number of lows can be seen to the west and the south of Tasmania. Low cloud extending into southeastern states. Convective clouds associated with troughs extend over Queensland and New South Wales with some embedded thunderstorm activity. Tomorrow, a low will move southeast of the state. A high forms over the southeast of Australia and the front weakens as it crosses the state. 
West to northwesterly winds 15 to 25 knots, lighter and more variable about the east, decreasing 10 to 20 about the west and the north, with seas between 1 and 2 metres. No warning, so onto the forecast. Cloudy in Hobart tomorrow, 19 degrees, 14 for Medina, Oatland 16, possible showers later throughout the north, 19 in Launceston, 17 for Devonport, 12 at Lyawini. Burnie 17 degrees, 16 for Strawn, showers there with 15 the top for Marawar and cloudy conditions in the east, 21 in St Helens, 19 for Swansea and 20 degrees at Orford. And the UV is high right around Tasmania. Sunday brings showers for the southwest, extending towards the northwest later on. Possible thunderstorms about the north and the northeast on Monday, light winds throughout the day, with showers about the west and the far south expected to clear later on Tuesday. Looking at your major centres now for tomorrow, 23 degrees in Perth and Canberra, 29 for Adelaide, mostly sunny there, 21 in Melbourne, 25 degrees in Sydney with a sunny 32 in Brisbane. And at the moment it's 15 degrees and cloudy right across the board. Thanks for having me tonight, Kim. We'll see you next week. Our pleasure. Thank you, Sam. And that is all your news for this Friday the 13th. Louise will join you over the weekend. Thanks for being with us this week and I'll see you Monday. Good night.